this time around we have another Philips television. This is the Philips 28DC 2070-20R. It's a 66 centimetre sized CRTV or 28 inches. A curved screen with a 4x3 aspect ratio. I'm guessing the date of manufacture is around 1994 or 1995. The service menu suggests possibly 1990. I do have my doubts on that so I'm not totally sure on its date of manufacture. Now you may have seen a few months ago I had a video that featured two Philips televisions in the same video. And with those two, one was an evolution of the other. And this TV we've got in front of us today is a continuation of that evolution again. So what I've basically got is one of the older ones out again to, to make a quick comparison. Um, let's have a look at this one. Firstly, let's go to the front right. We've got a mains power on off switch, one of those ones that presses right in and out. We've got a flap that comes down here with a headphone port, an S video, and stereo left and right in. Phillips badge, uh, channel up and down, volume up and down, and then we have some illuminated um, lights or messages. And I really like how that says RGB there when the TV goes into RGB mode. It uh, illuminates the RGB, it's a nice touch. And that button there I think is a setup button. You know, you push that when you first get the TV and you can tune in channels and do that sort of thing. Um, cosmetically, you know, just have a look at this one. I mean, it's only a TV, there's nothing too special about it, but we have changed a little bit in the front here. We've got some sort of round feet on the corners, but one of the hallmarks of this line of TVs is the dis detachable speakers on the back. You can see these big, big speakers here. If I can just hold the camera and take that off at the same time, I can demonstrate it. It's having some difficulty. There it is. It's, come, it's coming off. All right. So that's there are the four pegs on the side that hold the speaker. On those pegs can unscrew. Uh, there's your speaker separated, and you can hang that out to the side of your room. Spread the sound out a bit. The cable on that's hardwired in straight into the speaker, and of course you've got the speaker on the other side. In comparison, the older style of TV, it's got a, a smaller speaker. See that nearly down to the bench there? It's got a fair gap. So they certainly made the speakers bigger in size. This older TV is 59 centimeters, where this new one is 66, so we've worn up a bit. All right, I'll just put that speaker out of the way now. We'll go to the old television and have a look at the connections on it. So it's got one SCART. Uh, it's got a series of headphone ports, so which which are for the speakers. I think you can actually plug four speakers in, two at the front, two at the back. Um, probably a sound out, RF, and S-video in, and the sound in for the S-video. So that's what this older one's got. Now if we go to the newer Philips, I'll take that SCART out so we can see better. All right, we've got a lot more, lot more connections now. Um, we've got something down here, I don't even know what what that type of connector is and what it's for. Uh, the headphone style jacks are gone for the speaker wires. Instead, we've got your more traditional speaker terminal wire connectors there. We've got two SCARTs instead of one, but SCART one here, the blue one is the RGB one. And there's our orange one. Um, sound out, yes, RF, and there's an S-video set out and another S-video in. So there's quite a few S-video sockets on the TV, two in and one out. There's your badge with your model ID. Again, another badge there, a sticker, and another one down there as well. Uh, 220, 240 watt, made in Belgium. Okay, we'll take the shell off and have a quick look. The back shell is off. It was held in by Torx security screws. You don't often see those in TVs, but this one has it. Um, fairly small neck board on the back there. Again, there's another label like before, made in Belgium, and the tube is a Philips A6666, referring to the size of the tube, EAK, made in Germany. The one over there has a Toshiba in it. This one has a Philips. Uh, there was something else, the yoke. The yoke, that is the moulded yoke top. That is one that's found in a lot of German-made TVs, the Lervers and Grundigs and so forth. There are no convergence rings on those. They're all sort of a one-piece assembly. So that's pretty much it. Um, 
yeah of course no speakers inside because they're external oh that's one other thing i want to make note of too while i think of it just hold on a moment the phillips has quite a unusual means to get into the service mode uh, it doesn't have a code that you push on the remote it doesn't have a means where you hold some buttons down and then turn the power on and the service menu presents itself instead you've actually got a short out um, two pins here on the chassis I think they're labeled M30 and M31 you've actually got to just short them out with something hold that on there for a second or two and that'll get you into the service menu believe it or not it's not really practical because you have to take the back half off and you've got to sort of touch something while the TV is powered it's not it's not really the best way I think but that's how you do it and I'll demonstrate now I've just turned the TV on and I will short these two out like that and there we go the service menu is now activated I just wonder about these numbers here if that's the date like a backwards sort of thing 1990 11th to the 12th I'm not sure about that not sure uh, I should actually show you the remote while we're at this um, point and I actually did manage to get a genuine matching Philips remote with this TV for once I haven't on the other Philips there's the model number RC5910 and you can of course uh, go through the various vertical size and um, I think that's vertical linearity and not sure what some of them horizontal size uh, it's not the best menu system you've got to you can't scroll backwards you have to go through everything forwards and it's a little bit annoying but anyway at least it does have one okay let's go on to something else okay I've got a few things to explain here now I have a Sega Saturn an NTSC Japanese Saturn hooked up and it is supplying signal to both televisions at the same time so it's having the identical signal going in to both Philips TVs now the older TV on the left there does not have NTSC playback it can display a 50 and 60 Hertz signal it'll stabilize and show the picture but it will not display an NTSC color signal during composite and S video signals RGB is fine for it in SCART RGB is no problem but when it comes to an NTSC color signal it will not um, display it so with the new television here on the right this TV does have NTSC playback and you can see on the TV there you can choose between PAL Seacom and NTSC so that's that is an improvement no doubt um, but let's let's look a bit further into it now the satin still hooked in to the Philips the new one but using S video so we're using NTSC S video and the picture looks crap this TV does not resolve does not display NTSC S video properly at all well, it does display it but it looks absolutely poor I've used the PS2 in NTSC with S video and it's the same result so it appears to be a design fault of the TV it will not handle an NTSC S video signal a PAL one yes but not NTSC now the satin is hooked into the back of the TV in S video in port number two external number two if you want to call it that as I showed earlier in the video there is an S video input here which is number three external three I will just show you that just show you quickly I'm trying not to confuse things here but right now we're on connection number two with the Saturn S video and you go to system and you can change between PAL and NTSC okay so PAL no NTSC yes that's fine if we were going to use an S video device in the front we would change it to external number three but option seven is gone to choose between PAL and NTSC so any source that goes into here external number three S video must be in PAL must be in PAL 
Not that it would matter because we just saw NTSC SVD and not work anyway. So the bottom line is the new Philips here does not display NTSC S-Video. Now I'm going to run a Sony PlayStation in SCART RGB. This is a PAL Sony PlayStation in RGB. So when I turn it on, it'll be giving out a 50 hertz video signal with RGB. The game is an NTSC game. So when the game actually gets going, it'll switch to a 60 hertz signal. Okay, so we have the PlayStation's boot up screen, that's fine. Next one, no problem. The game's about to go any second now, and it'll switch into 60 hertz. Now it's done that, it's not displaying correctly, because the TV unfortunately doesn't automatically switch from PAL to NTSC, which is not a huge problem. It wouldn't have been back in the day if you were lucky to have a SCART display of any sort back in the 90s but in this modern day and age where we have a better choice of SCART televisions um, switching between NTSC and PAL is just about always automatic it had been for years before this television had come out so that is also a bit of a backward step um, see I can change it go into system number seven and then go across and put it into um, NTSC so we're we're right to go again. We can play the game now, no problem. But let's say we want to swap games, right? Turn the PlayStation off, put a different game in. Oh, we're still in NTSC mode. The PlayStation's a PAL one, so it boots up in PAL. So we've got to change it back to PAL again if we're going to play a PAL game. Or we can just leave it as is if it's an NTSC game. So you're going to have to do that every time you switch from PAL to NTSC. Now here's the here's the irony of it all. This newer TV here does have that ability to go from PAL and NTSC with composite, with S video and with RGB. The old one over here, as I said before, does not do it with composite and does not do it with S video. But in RGB, the old one is actually better in a sense. I'll show you. Got both of them on display. So the one on the left is displaying the PAL signal file, and the one on the right is still set to NTSC. Just keep in mind the one on the left is in PAL now, from the boot up. Now the game will switch it to NTSC 60Hz, and it's fine, it's stable. The old TV has no problem in RGB staying in either 50 or 60Hz, whereas the new one needs to be switched each and every time. So the old one is better in that respect. Uh, sorry to rant on a bit like that, but um, you know, it's pretty rare that I actually have identical signal fed into two or more TVs at once. I'm using a matrix switcher right now, as I did with the other signal, with the composite signal before. But I'm using the matrix switcher to do output RGB into both the TVs, so they're getting identical signal. So it makes for a very good uh, comparison between the two sets. Now, I'm a big fan of the old... Philips here with the Toshiba tube inside it, um, but having it side by side with um, the newer one, you can see a bit of difference. Really, the, the older Toshiba is not as, as bright. It doesn't quite have the kick that the newer Philips does, um, but in saying that, it's also a bit sharper. It's just a bit more clearer, and the scan lines on it are a bit more prominent. I'm not sure which TV I would take. Um, but certainly the old Toshiba, the old Philips on the left is a bit sharper but a bit dim. Whereas the one on the right, it's uh, a little bit maybe blurrier. Not as sharp, but you get a bit of extra kick with the brightness. Uh, I do like the reds better on the left TV though. I think the one on the right definitely needs fine tuning in its service menu of its colours. I haven't taught myself how to calibrate colours on these things yet. But um, I'd definitely say that's what it needs. So really... At the end of the day, the new Philips here, which is this is the this is the one I want to focus on because I've done that other one before, but this one here in front of us, um, you know, picture's not bad, picture's all right, but not outstanding. You'd probably be better off still to get your Sony, your PVM, your Lervas, your Grundigs, whatever. Um, that NTSC to PAL switching really annoys me, and the incompatibility with S Video NTSC is a bit annoying too. So. 
you know, a few marks against the same and the service menu is a bit of a pain in the butt to get into, albeit you probably only need to do it once or twice in its life, but anyhow, it was interesting to find it. I've never seen this Phillips before, so that's why I snapped it up. Um, but yeah, not a, I can't really give it a strong recommendation at all to, uh, to go after it, but anyway, that's another one to cross off the list. And thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time.